the worst damage around 20th and Main. We've got whole buildings missing, multiple subjects injured. If we can get a hold of any fire trucks, we got the Payless building completely down, two people in them, and one of them's my wife, and we can't get in there anyway. Jasper to all stations, Fire West, be advised St. John's was hit in this storm. In the wake of devastation at the cities of Joplin and Duquesne, those communities were faced with a key question. It basically went from finding people in the debris, you know, finding people alive, finding things that you don't want to see, to what are you going to do with your life now? Am I going to stay here in Joplin or am I going to move somewhere else? And I think that's a lot of the thing that people are trying to figure out if they're going to continue to live here, continue to rebuild. In the hours following the storm, the Federal Emergency Management Agency stood up a disaster response. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers would play a crucial role in helping the communities of Joplin and Duquesne recover. When an event like this goes off, it's a no-notice event. We, FEMA, under the Stafford Act, brings together all the required federal agencies, and they do that under what they call emergency support functions. In our case, we're emergency support function three, public works and engineering. FEMA called upon the Kansas City District and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to help facilitate the Corps mission through the establishment and support of a recovery field office. We received a mission assignment to establish a recovery field office later uh, in the week. And by the 28th, uh, which was a Saturday, 28th of May, we had a recovery field office uh, leased and we had the initial remnants of the recovery field office on the ground. That recovery field office would face three missions, debris removal, temporary housing, and critical public facilities. Some 400 members of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers would descend upon the Joplin-Duquesne area at various points in the months following the tornado. Well, the first, uh, first primary mission was to clear the right-of-ways so that people could be get back to their homes, try to recover their personal property, um, and travel safely on the right-of-ways so that we can get more workers and crews into the affected area. Some 77 miles of rights-of-way had to be cleared initially. The conditions were less than optimal. You know, everything you can imagine was blown about. Uh, vegetation, trees were snapped off. Huge oaks um, were stripped of all the bark cars were tossed around. Amid the changing landscape, even as debris was removed, navigation through the affected areas was difficult. The city would respond in a unique way. There is no street signs whatsoever. Uh, even the people who had lived there all their lives could not find sometimes their own home. Uh, but the city recognized that very quickly. The cities went out and painted the street signs right on the right on the intersections. With older homes among those that were destroyed by the storm, asbestos in the debris became a real concern. In many instances, siding and tiles with that hazardous material were discovered. This necessitated the use of separate landfills and regular air testing to ensure the safety of workers and the public. The threat from these sidings and tiles is not as high as the threat from insulation or pipe coverings with asbestos. Still, extreme caution is used when removing the substance from a site. They will line one of the roll-off containers, either a 40-yard or a 20-yard container, that they'll fill with a plastic <clears throat> and hold it so that when they put the debris inside it, it will be encapsulated in there. It's what they call a burrito wrap. When they get done, they'll fold over the ends, fold the sides over and seal it and glue it down and then it will be taken to the uh, hazmat landfill. In that initial debris mission, an astounding 1.45 million cubic yards of material was cleared. It couldn't have been accomplished without the full cooperation with all of the different agencies, the cities, the utilities, and all the citizens actually were very helpful with identifying areas and very cooperative. As the debris mission progressed, the Corps aided in addressing temporary housing for those displaced from their homes. While FEMA provides the actual trailers, the Corps is tasked with developing all of the site infrastructure, including the concrete pads, the sewer lines, and power lines. Two sites were identified for housing, Officer Jeff Taylor Memorial Acres and Hope Haven. And those sites would account for a combined 346 homes. Well, we started construction here in Joplin on July 5th, and the initial stages, you want to get on all your sewer lines, 
So there's a lot of trenching going on, a lot of placement of sewer and water lines. Uh, we started initially the first three weeks working 24 hours a day. On August 7th, the first families began moving into their new homes. For many, this marked a turning point following the tornado. In the last three months, the places that we've been besides my mother's, I mean, the house that we found didn't feel like home. I mean, it was a place for us to stay, and that's what we did there, and that's what it felt like. <laughs> Just that we were staying somewhere for a little while. And this will give us a chance to actually have our own place and our own stuff again, and for the kids to say that they now have a house. In typical core fashion, the temporary housing mission progressed ahead of schedule. The pace that you see construction out here and it's just uh, it's remarkable to see something, an open field, for instance, like we have here at the airport site uh, three weeks ago, is now a, is a housing community. The temporary housing push coincided with the critical public facilities mission to prepare educational facilities as part of an overall goal to have schools ready in time for the start of the new school year. The 17th of August has uh, been a key milestone of ours that we've been back planning, not only for the critical public facilities where we have eight schools, uh, from elementary, middle, and high schools to, to provide uh, for the students, but also the temporary housing mission where we're focused on getting families with the school-age kids uh, in houses. That greater mission of getting children back into school became a focus of the response from the very beginning. You want to get back into that cycle of normalcy here in Joplin, and the schools with the children, that's very important because they can't really understand everything that happened to them on May 22nd and it happened right when school ended and to get them back into their natural cycle it helps the healing process so it's very important we stuck to the date of 17 August which was the natural day of opening school. That would be no small task as some 4,400 school children out of 7,700 in the Joplin Duquesne area were displaced. We think starting school is going to be a major step in the healing process for our community because this is normal. It's the way it should be. Kids should be in school and they should be learning. We also believe it was critically important to start school on time because this is their only opportunity to have their second grade year or their junior year. With many school buildings either destroyed or otherwise unusable, the Joplin School District identified new locations with existing structures to serve as temporary schools. But many of those facilities lacked the sheer capacity for classrooms or specialized uses. So the Corps undertook construction of additional modular units to supplement the structures, as well as storm shelters. Under normal construction processes, the contracting alone might have taken a month and a half. That wouldn't work under these circumstances, so the Corps turned to expedited contracting processes. We were able to get these designs done quickly so everybody can start immediately, because a, week, a day in Joplin is like a week back in the district. You can't, you can't wait a day. During the tornado, Irving Elementary was destroyed. An old school building that had been used for administrative purposes would be converted into a new facility to house students. The Corps would come alongside and construct two additional modular units for the school, including a kitchen. So then it became, okay, here's a building, but it's not big enough to hold everyone. What are we going to do? And that's where Army Corps came in, and Army Corps is my hero. They got on site. They established a deadline. They actually finished three days before deadline. Similarly, the Joplin High School was decimated by the storm. To address the needs of those students, a temporary school for the 11th and 12th grades would be established at an empty Shopco store at a local mall. At this site, the Corps would construct modular units for science labs as well as kitchen facilities. This is actually the facility that we got the permission to begin work on the latest. It's the largest of the build-outs that we've had to do for our replacement facilities, and it's come together. It's, it's been wonderful, but it's, been, it's come together because of a lot of people. And so our success to start on time on August 17th is about school district people and community people and architects and engineers and the Corps of Engineers. For parents, having school start is a huge help. As their parent trying to make them get through this, even though I'm having trouble as well, I mean, I want to be strong for them and let them know that everything's going to work out. And this will definitely make us all happy. It is a sentiment repeated by many in the education community of Joplin. Um, when the Corps was down here initially, a person told me there were 18 natural disasters happening. 
I never really paid attention. Now when I hear it, it's like, oh my goodness. Now I can say, I kind of know what they're going through. I didn't know the Army Corps of Engineer before. I didn't know what you guys did. I don't even think I knew your title before. And now I know how crucial it is, the role that you play in helping us get back to our new normal. Prior to helping schools reestablish, however, there was the pressing need of rebuilding infrastructure for emergency first responders. The tornado leveled two firehouses in Joplin. Those stations had to work out of makeshift facilities in the ensuing days. We were supposed to have a delivery date of July 4th, and we had the fire, uh, fire stations ready by July 1st. And, and that was important because it was 100 plus degrees here in Joplin and the, and the firemen were sitting in trailers with Porter Johns. Now the firefighters can work out of modular units for the next year and a half until new firehouses are constructed. Immediately after the tornado we had uh, no normalcy. Everything's changed, you know, we're unable to, uh, to get back to regular life. So to have a home again is, is a huge stress relief. Just some place that's ours, that's not uh, you know, a tent or a trailer that's going to be gone tomorrow. And with critical public facilities, one large project remains. During the tornado, St. John's Regional Medical Center in Joplin took a direct hit. The force of the storm was so strong, it literally moved the massive concrete building off its foundation by several inches. To keep serving the community, the medical center moved into mass units, but more permanent structures are needed until a new hospital can be built. The Corps has begun site design for a 1.2 million square foot facility using modular units along 31 acres of land adjacent to the hospital. To achieve this mission, the Recovery Field Office is using reachback capabilities with the New York District of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Instead of deploying everybody down here to work on the hospital, we can use them back in the district where their local uh, liaisons between the hospital and we, we go to all the meetings and, and coordinate with all the architects and engineers. Eventually the project will be handed off to the Kansas City District for the actual construction. The facility currently is set to be completed in early April. Throughout the recovery effort, the Corps is striven to meet the needs of the affected communities. It is an effort that has not gone unnoticed. But Colonel Hoffman, the Corps of Engineers, his deal is we get in the first meeting and he's 75 days, got it. Got to get uh, 3 million yards, got it. We're going to get it done, got it. I mean, it, I mean, his mission was just, got it. It didn't matter what it was, he had it. We're going to get it done. We don't know how, but we're going to figure out a way how to get it done. I can't be any prouder of the volunteers and the, the citizens of the city of Joplin, but I can't be any more in debt than I am to you guys right here. Thank you seems not nearly enough. Uh, there's got to be a word that expresses my gratitude more than thank you, but I don't know what it is. And while the effort began with the Kansas City District and its establishment of a recovery field office, it would not have been possible without the support of the entire Corps. The appreciation we have for the supporting districts around the country. I think we've had almost every district in the Corps of Engineers support this mission, uh, from Alaska, Hawaii, all the way down to, to Florida and Jacksonville. So uh, we have had a lot of volunteers, over 400 people from the Corps of Engineers who have worked their way through this office at, at any time during the mission. Joplin has become a symbol of many things, the fury of nature and the devastation it can leave behind, the resilience of the human will, the spirit of volunteerism that can overcome great obstacles, and it will stand as a testament to the capacity of local, state, and federal agencies to partner for the greater good of a wounded community.